All right, everybody. We're going to start the webinar right now. So my name is Yan Sang, and I'm the electronic resource librarian at North Carolina State University. And on behalf of the NISIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our October webinar. Um, Our October webinar is How Accessible is Our Collection, Performing an E-Resource Accessibility Review. So, um, and our speaker for today is uh, Michael Fernandez. So before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded, and anyone who registers for the webinar will receive a link to the recording via email shortly following the webinar. And second, if you have any questions for Michael during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window. The Q&A box will then appear in the lower right corner. Michael will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you will take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we are doing, what we can do better, and start share ideas for future webinars. We always welcome new ideas. So, and with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. Michael Fernandez is the Electronic Resource Librarian at American University, where he oversees an ERM unit responsible for providing access to a diverse array of databases, e-journals, e-books, and datasets. He received his MLS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has previously held positions at the National Library of Medicine and the University of Mary Washington. His research interests include licensing collection management and ERM staffing. Okay, um, I will now turn things over to Michael. Just give me a sec. Great. Uh, thanks okay. again for the introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. We can hear everything okay? Awesome. Uh, and yeah. thank you to yeah, thanks again for the introduction, and thank you to NASIG for hosting this webinar. Hi there, and good afternoon. My name is Michael Fernandez, and I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at American University in Washington, D.C. The webinar I'm presenting today is entitled, How Accessible is Our Collection? Performing an E-Resources Accessibility Review. Uh, this webinar is based off of a talk that I gave at this year's NASIG conference in Indianapolis. I've also incorporated some updates and new findings since I presented in June. So if perchance you had seen me present at NASIG, there will be something new for you today. Uh, so now the question that you see before you was posed to me and my electronic resources management unit in the summer of 2016. In this webinar, I'll be telling you about how we went about answering that question and what we found out in the process. So let's see if the slide advance works. Okay, awesome. Uh, in terms of the learning outcomes for this session, I hope to cover some of the laws, benchmarks, and tools that support accessibility, detail a methodology for assessing the accessibility of a library's e-resource collection, show how to identify allies at your institution and develop relationships in working towards the shared goal of accessibility, and discuss strategies for vendor outreach. But first, I'll tell you a little bit more about American University. We're a private doctoral institution located in Washington, D.C. AU is most known for its programs in government, international service, and public administration. Our FTE is around 12,000. In terms of our materials budget, $4.5 million of the total 
5.5 million budget goes towards electronic resources, and we provide access to a collection of over 500 databases. I've been in my current position of electronic resources librarian since February of 2015. I manage an ERM unit consisting of two full-time specialists. We're responsible for all aspects of the e-resources lifecycle, from trials to licensing new resources, establishing and troubleshooting access, and gathering usage statistics, and compiling reports for collection assessment. This particular project had its origins a little under a year ago in a memo from AU's president that went out university-wide. This memo addressed the importance and timeliness of improving the accessibility of AU's web content, citing recent complaints that have been filed at Penn State and the University of Montana wherein those institutions entered into resolution agreements with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. Per the Council of our university's Web Steering Committee, accessibility was made a priority for receiving detailed attention. This was in conjunction with efforts that the Web Steering Committee had first made in 2015 after their initial web accessibility assessment. These efforts were made at an enterprise level for university-wide web content, i.e. Uh, AU's main homepage and associated sites. However, the memo underscored that a larger and more localized effort would be needed by web content creators in every school, college, and division in order to address all outstanding accessibility issues. Within AU Library, we've been making dedicated efforts to improve accessibility of the library's web content. The library has a web advisory council, which I had previously sat on, and we've used evaluation tools such as WAVE to test and approve the accessibility of our website. There's also currently an effort to make all associated PDF content accessible. However, we did not have a sense of the accessibility of our third-party license e-resources that are discoverable and linked to through our website. These e-resources are among the most valuable and vital services provided by the library, not to mention some of the most expensive and it's essential that they be available to all users in the AU community. With this goal in mind, the ERM unit undertook a project to inventory and evaluate the accessibility of the library's subscribed online content. Before going into further detail on the inventory project, I'll briefly review how accessibility is defined and cite some of the pertinent laws. Accessibility is one area of user experience design which ensures an equal online experience for users with disabilities, or as Angela Dresselhaus put it in a 2013 presentation, users with disabilities should be able to obtain the same information at the same time for the same price and at the same quality as those users without disabilities. Accessibility makes websites usable through design principles such as captioning, image tagging, keyboard shortcuts, uh, adjustable font sizing, as well as assistive technology such as screen readers. Accessibility is often thought of as an added feature when it should be a built-in capability. More often than not, when the user experience is designed with accessibility in mind, it benefits everyone. In Dressel House's presentation, she cites text-to-speech functions as a technique anyone can use to facilitate proofreading. Okay. So among the key pieces of legislation for accessibility are Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. This states that users with disabilities cannot be excluded from programs or activities that are funded by federal dollars. As an institution that receives federal funding through financial aid, AU is required to adhere. Additionally, there is Section 508 of the Re Rehabilitation Act, which requires access to electronic and information technology, or EIT, procured by the federal government. There's also the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.0. This is a wide range of recommendations for making web content more accessible issued by the W3C, or World Wide Web Consortium, the main international standards organization for the World Wide Web. 
WCAG is actually a good deal more forceful and comprehensive than our national guidelines with a defined structure of layers of guidance that includes overall principles, general guidelines, testable success criteria, and a collection of sufficient and advisory techniques. Finally, there's the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT. This is a document developed by the Information Technology Industry Council, which includes compliance with Section 508 guidelines. So you'll be hearing a lot more about VPATs throughout this presentation, but here I'd like to mention the VPAT repository, which is a community-based project from Libraries for Universal Accessibility. The repository links to or houses a number of VPATs that have been posted with the vendor's permission. It also helpfully lists the VPAT dates, which could potentially clue you into whether a more recent VPAT is available. There are links to vendor accessibility statements as well. This was an extremely valuable resource to us in the early stages of the inventory project. Okay. Um, one uh, additional community-based project that I'd like to mention is the uh, eBook Accessibility Audit, a joint project between several universities in the United Kingdom, librarians, disability services, and vendor representatives. In the audit, nearly, major, ev nearly every major publisher uh, eBook platform was reviewed by multiple institutions with individual reports produced based on the composite findings. While usability testing was beyond the scope of the inventory we conducted, this type of work is integral to accessibility. There's a lot of work needing to be done, and collaborative projects such as this are a valuable approach to the seemingly daunting task. So uh, what we looked for in our accessibility inventory uh, were uh, um, accessibility statements, VPATs, and license language. So these were the three components that we identified uh, for the inventory. So for the accessibility statements, we reviewed the databases and platforms themselves for a publicly viewable page on the vendor website which states their commitment to accessibility, compliance with best practices, recommendations, and federal requirements, and their compatibility with assistive technology. Second, we looked for those VPATs, uh, either publicly viewable on the vendor's website or available by request from the vendor. For our final metric, we reviewed the existing license we had on file. We searched for any language within the library's signed contract outlining the vendor's adherence to accessibility guidelines or their willingness to work with the library in order to bring the license content into compliance. Using these three data points, the ERM unit sought to determine each vendor's engagement with accessibility issues. To achieve this, an Excel spreadsheet was compiled listing each database, platform, or platform arranged by vendor. Uh, so I did tell you you'd be hearing a lot about VPATs. Uh, when dealing with VPATs, there are some caveats, plural, that should be noted. Not all VPATs are created equal. It's been said before, but the key word in voluntary product accessibility template is voluntary. It's literally the first word. There's no outside agency that requires vendors to complete VPATs or evaluates the accuracy of the vendor supplied statements. Librarians have been stepping in to do both of these. So this is a form that's vendor supplied, and as our unit quickly found out in gathering them, they can be filled out with varying degrees of completeness and detail. Consistency is a major issue with VPATs. The better ones will contain contact information and in some cases a job title for whoever completed them. Uh, in some cases it's quite possible that the person filling them out has little or no familiarity with Section 508 or accessibility. There's also the possibility that the vendor supplied information in the VPATs is just plain inaccurate. In 2015, a study by Laura Delancey took a small sample of VPATs for 17 resources and compared the results of automated accessibility scans. The study concluded that the VPAT was inaccurate 19.6% of the time. All right. uh, so here's an example of one of the more detailed VPATs. 
that we came across in our inventory. Uh, this one is uh, actually from EBSCO. As you can see, it states what criteria are supported and gives background commentary in cases where criteria are supported with exceptions. If criteria is not applicable, there's an explanation as to why. In contrast, uh, here's a not so great example of a VPAT. Uh, I'm not going to publicly shame the vendor here, but as you can see, the remarks and explanation section is a bit sparse. There is no accompanying commentary for whether a feature is supported, not supported, or as to why it would be non-applicable to the product. You have one case where the remark is simply alt tags. Uh, the reader of this VPAT could ostensibly infer this to mean alt tags, yep, we've got them, but uh, perhaps some further detail could elucidate matters here. Uh, for the purposes of our inventory, we did not set out to analyze the completeness or accuracy of VPATs. We just wanted to confirm the existence of one for our licensed resources with the understanding that a VPAT does not necessarily equate to accessibility. I want to take a little more time and also discuss WCAG 2.0 in some further detail as it's increasingly becoming the preferred guidance in terms of accessibility, at least as of the date of this webinar. As I said, WCAG is organized along layers of guidance that are more or less hierarchical. At the top are four principles which state that electronic information technology should be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Under the principles are 12 guidelines providing basic accessibility goals that web content authors should work toward. For each guideline, there's testable success criteria with three defined levels of conformance, from lowest to highest being A, AA, and AAA. Finally, sufficient and advisory techniques is the documentation in the WCAG document itself informing the reader if the success criteria is sufficiently met with advisory techniques being suggested ways to improve accessibility. As of this year, 2017, Section 508 is undergoing revision or a refresh as it has been termed. Uh, the outcome of this refresh is that Section 508 will now apply WCAG 2.0 AA conformance into its accessibility compliance measures. Uh, that's the short version of things. For those of you that are interested or uh, any of my GovDoc librarian friends out there, uh, there's a 50-page ruling uh, in the Federal Register, which I will confess to only having skimmed the contents of. Uh, another major outcome of this will be changes to the VPAT form itself, which will be moving to incorporate WCAG 2.0. The revised VPAT form, or VPAT 2.0, will be the standard going forward after January 18th, 2018. How will this impact the accessibility landscape? Well, I can confidently tell you that I do not know. To be honest, it's a minor cause for celebration when a vendor can supply us with a VPAT 1.0 form, and those are getting discontinued in January. If I had to prognosticate on this, I would guess that the major vendors will be the early adopters of the new VPATs, probably not exactly on January 18th, but possibly over the course of the next year. These, vendor, these major vendors should continue to make strides towards WCAG conformance, whereas the smaller vendors will likely continue to lag behind on accessibility. Just to give you an idea of what WCAG principles and guideline documentation looks like, here's a statement of WCAG conformance from ProQuest. So I haven't seen too many of these out in the wild. Uh, you're more likely to find vendor VPATs if that. I'm also not here to endorse ProQuest, but they have taken a lot of steps towards transparency on their accessibility measures that other vendors have not. There's a dedicated accessibility directory on ProQuest's support center that's easily Googleable. Uh, as you can see, this looks quite a lot like a VPAT with each guideline itemized and documentation as to how that accessibility measure is or isn't supported. I don't have any examples of VPAT 2.0 yet as it hasn't been implemented, but we can expect to, uh, to see something uh, resembling 
uh, this in terms of our VPATs. Uh, they will probably resemble this more as the uh, WCAG 2.0 standards become broadly applied. So uh, now that I've given you a fairly brief, or depending on your view, punishingly long overview of accessibility benchmarks, let's jump into talking about the inventory project that we performed at American University. Compiling the inventory was a rather labor-intensive process involving the efforts of both of our full-time specialists and the ERM unit. Uh, this is the point in the webinar where I will pause to give shout outs to Nicole and Jana, our specialists who put a tremendous amount of work into the inventory and they continue to do so as our accessibility initiatives have expanded and persist in being a high priority for AU Library. The initial list of resources, 528 in total, was pulled from our ERMS and it included databases as well as ebook and e-journal platforms. We use serial solutions and the inventory was based off what we list on our databases A to Z libguide. To facilitate the data gathering, the specialists broke resources down by vendor, which made it easier when we had numerous databases on the same vendor platform as was the case with uh, your EBSCOs, ProQuest, Gale, your bigger vendors. Uh, the VPAT depository, again, served as a good starting point for identifying VPATs and accessibility statements for these more common library vendors. In looking for accessibility statements, we looked for pages that were linked to from the database's landing page or terms of use section. Uh, if we failed to find something that wasn't a few clicks away, we would try Googling the database or publisher and the words accessibility statement. When we found something, it typically had the helpful title of accessibility statement with an explanation of the vendor's commitment to usability for all. If there was also mention of compliance with Section 508, well, then that was gravy. Again, we just wanted the vendors to show us something. What we found got noted along with the referencing URL in the spreadsheet. So here is uh, an example, uh, a good example of an accessibility statement. Uh, this comes from Alexander Street Press. Uh, so what this accessibility statement does is it describes the platform's user design in relation to compliance with Section 508 and WCAG. There's also verbiage on its compatibility with assistive technology, such as JAWS, and Alexander Street Press points to 90% of their films being captioned. And they also note that ongoing efforts are being made to caption newly added titles. So good job, Alexander Street Press there. Uh, so after accessibility statements, the second measure we looked for was VPATs. In some cases, the VPAT was also linked off the accessibility statement, and that was great. The VPAT repository was another source, and uh, once again, if that failed, Google's your friend. Uh, we tried Googling the, the names and uh, word, the vendor names and the word VPAT, so just putting together combinations there to try to get at the VPATs. Um, in cases where we weren't finding uh, VPATs that way, we would reach out to the vendor once with a VPAT request. Uh, we would just reach out to them the one time without, uh, we didn't hear back from them. We weren't following up multiple times. Okay, so reviewing our existing licenses uh, was perhaps the most onerous data, gather, data gathering task in the inventory and the one we were certain would turn up the least compliance from vendors. Most of our licenses date back 10 or more years. Uh, simply put, this was a time before accessibility concerns were on the radar of most vendors. As a side note, we also found out during this process that uh, quite a number of our older licenses have not been digitally scanned. So that necessitated more than a few deep dives into our old warhorse of filing cabinets. Again, not the most uh, pleasant part of the inventory and the one that yielded the fewest positives for accessibility. 
Uh, but the positive outcome of all of this data gathering is that for the first time, we now have all the information in one spreadsheet. So we can conveniently reference the accessibility of a particular resource or vendor platform. Uh, the downside to that is that currently this just exists as a standalone spreadsheet and the information is not yet integrated with our other library systems. Uh, so here you see a screen cap of that spreadsheet in all its glory, uh, not the most exciting visual admittedly, but uh, if anyone out there is interested in the blank template, I would be happy to share it and my contact information will be at the end of the webinar. So uh, one of the next steps that we're contemplating is how best to reflect accessibility in our ERMS so we can easily pull that information without referring to the spreadsheet and document it for our e-resources going forward. In Serial Solutions, the licensing module doesn't have fields for accessibility or a checkbox for a VPAT. So there's the possibility of using custom notes, but we haven't investigated that yet. Uh, as it so happens, we're getting set for an ALMA migration in 2018, so it's a possibility that we'll port this data over post-migration. Uh, in my reviewing of the ALMA licensing functionality, I did note that they have an accessibility compliance indicator, uh, and that's definitely helpful. I think indicator is a good operative word, as with this inventory, we want to be able to point to license verbiage or a statement that indicates accessibility. The question of accessibility itself is decidedly more complex and won't have a binary yes or no answer. Alma also gives the option to add custom free text fields, which we may take advantage of, and we can link documents to resources, which we might look into with our VPATs. So now on to the results. Uh, we looked at a total of 528 e-resources based off our database A to Z listing. Of those e-resources, accessibility statements were the most commonly identified measure, with 340, or 64%, being associated with a vendor website statement. VPATs were slightly less common, with vendors providing VPATs covering 292 or 55% of the library's subscribed e-resources. Finally, license language was by far the least commonly identified measure, with contract language only applicable to 4% or 20 e-resources. In terms of overall representation, 376 of the library's e-resources had at least one indicator or measure of accessibility present, either being a statement on the publisher website, a VPAT, or language within the license agreement. This indicates that 71% of resources could be associated with at least some effort on the part of the publisher towards accessibility. Two measures of accessibility, uh, these typically being an accessibility statement and a VPAT, were present for 52% of the library's resources. Lastly, only three of our e-resources uh, had all three of the measures of accessibility that had been sought during this inventory. So the next slide uh, shows the analysis uh, when we performed it at the vendor level. We found that proportionally fewer vendors presented accessibility measures. So you can see those results here. When we generalized our analysis to the vendor level, the compliance percentages were noticeably lower. Apart from the license language, which remained comparably low at both the vendor and resource level. So uh, just to give you kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of that uh, on this slide, uh, yeah, I put together this comparison. So it's comparing the presence of our accessibility measures at the resource level compared to the vendor level. Um, so uh, percentage-wise, um, the portion of vendors with accessibility statements and VPATs was roughly half of, was it, of what it was for e-resources with accessibility statements and VPATs. Uh, and I do see that a uh, question may come up, uh, just to uh, that quickly. Uh, 
I would have to say offhand, I don't, uh, let's see, I would have to do the math there to guess the number of uh, vendors that was, but if 77 uh, vendors was 40%, um, it would be, I don't know, probably in the ballpark of maybe 160, 170 vendors, uh, just to catch that question. Yeah, Michael, just to uh, pause a little bit, I think, I, uh, yeah, let me read the question to everybody. So the question was, um, are your results by vendor slide 22? Out of how many vendors did you look at? Okay. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't realize uh, not everyone's seen that question. Uh, yeah, so that was the question that came up and yeah, it was, I would estimate in the in the ballpark of maybe 170 vendors total. Uh, that we work with with our e-resources. Okay, so yeah, uh, there's the comparison of uh, the ex uh, vendors versus resource in terms of our three accessibility measures. Again, you can see that in general, uh, twice as likely to present that at the resource level than the vendor level. And then, uh, this shows a comparison for the number of measures present. Uh, so yeah, there's the same side-by-side -side comparison of resource versus vendor. Uh, and that this slide, uh, as you can see, it kind of bared out the same two to one or greater discrepancy, with the exception of resources with all three measures, which is more or less the same for both percentage-wise. So why was there this discrepancy? Uh, because a small number of vendors account for a disproportionately large amount of our e-resource subscriptions, and I imagine that's probably the case at most libraries, for the most part, these larger vendors are much more likely to present accessibility measures. At AU, we subscribe to a number of highly specialized resources to support our programs in public policy and international studies. Many of these resources are produced by uh, Many of these resources are produced by small firms where sales, technical support, and management are all the same person. They are less likely to have experts on accessibility or user experience on staff. One vendor we, re we requested a VPAT from asked us if we could fill out the template for them. That's a true story. Uh, when I shared that in the original presentation at NASIG, I got a few laughs from the audience, but I also saw more than a few nodding heads. So this is clearly a not uncommon experience with librarians requesting VPATs from vendors. So there's a lot of teachable moments out there. AU has a number of specialized resources that support our business programs, and these often had no accessibility documentation either. A possible explanation could be that many of these resources are produced for the private sector, as opposed to educational institutions or those that receive federal funding. At the time of this presentation, uh, when I originally presented at NASIG, I had identified a potential area for further study, which would be to analyze whether resources in different subject areas concentrations were more or less likely to have accessibility support. Well, I can say that uh, we made that dream a reality, and here is that analysis. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the subject breakdown represents our collection areas at American University. So that's why international studies and public affairs are separate significant collection areas. The findings seem to confirm our initial analysis in that both international studies and business, two areas where we have a good deal of highly specialized e-resources, demonstrate a proportionally higher tendency for the resources to lack accessibility support. Overall, the large majority of our e-resources are covered by the presence of an accessibility statement and or a VPAT. Again, that's largely due to so many of our e-resources coming from major vendors who have been aware of accessibility issues for some time and have made efforts to make their products accessible. Additionally, the reasoning why so few resources have supported license language uh, or supporting license language for accessibility is due to the fact that many of these contracts date back a decade or more and strides towards greater accessibility have really only begun being made in, I'd say, the last five years or so. So it's definitely worth noting that what this inventory served to do was to provide a snapshot of the collection in terms of accessibility. 
And the measures gathered represent a bare minimum of effort that can be made by vendors in terms of accessibility. While some vendors have done much more than others, this inventory used accessibility statements as a starting point to ascertain which vendors are minimally acknowledging the importance of accessibility. Among the accessibility statements that the ERM unit viewed, the wording varied widely between a sentence or two denoting the vendor's commitment to making their products accessible on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, there were off, there would be in some statements lengthy descriptions of how they fully comply with Section 508 requirements and with CAG guidelines. So certainly all accessibility statements are not created equal, but for the purposes of this inventory, identifying the presence of one was an important initial step. The same goes for VPATs. The presence of a VPAT does not in and of itself guarantee Section 508 compliance. Going back to that Delancey study, uh, which highlighted discrepancies uh, in the vendor reporting VPAT data, data and the compliance of the e-resources being described. Again, Delancey found that in about 20% uh, of the time, the information in the VPAT's inaccurate. Uh, what this inventory has served to document was which vendors have taken or are taking steps towards accessibility and which vendors have no documented accessibility efforts. While it's important to pursue documentation from the vendors who have provided none, it's also true that accessibility is a moving target and all resources can stand to improve. So what can we do as librarians to improve the accessibility of our e-resources? As our inventory demonstrated, the licensing process is one area where immediate attention can be paid to adding accessibility clauses and verbiage to our contracts. The lib license model has some suggested verbiage listed under section 5.1, licensor performance obligations. Additionally, you can reach out to your university's procurement department and discuss preferred verbiage. Chances are they may already be having this conversation. In the early stages of our accessibility inventory, the ERM unit met with our procurement liaison as well as a representative from the Office of General Counsel who advises procurement on legal matters. They clarified that the university's legal obligations stem from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act because the university receives federal financial assistance. Under Section 504, individuals with disabilities need insured access to resources and services provided through university websites. The verbiage you see here comes from our counsel and we work with vendors to get this included in our new licenses. And if need be, we can modify this wording just so that we get some version, some version of it into the license. So another uh, valuable outreach opportunity is to identify what services exist uh, for users with disabilities and to connect with those offices that work with assistive technology and accessibility support. They can serve as useful allies and demonstrate what assistive technology is in use at your institution. So these can include screen readers, uh, NVDA or non-visual desktop access is a free resource. JAWS is another common screen reader. Uh, additionally, computers have built-in screen reading software. So there's narrator for PC and voiceover for Mac. There's also Magic, which is a screen magnification software and I'd mentioned WAVE before, that's an online tool that can allow you to evaluate the accessibility of any web page. It's something that we've used at AU during the redesign of our library web pages. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so last summer, uh, while still in the early stages of the inventory project, the ERM unit met with our library liaison in the Academic Support and Access Center. She provided us with information on assistive technology, as well as basic tools and techniques for accessibility testing. For example, making certain you could reach all sections of the web page without the mouse and solely with the keyboard, using shortcuts and tabbing, and making sure all images had alt text and that any videos were captioned. Additionally, she offered to help with testing e-resources that were being trialed or e-resources that were newly acquired. Your university's assistive technology and disability support personnel can be excellent allies as you work towards accessibility. 
Depending on the library, your staff may not have the bandwidth nor the training necessary to conduct usability testing of e-resources. This is where accessibility support can partner with the library. In working with patrons with disabilities, they'll be able to share their perspectives from working directly with your university community. They can also demonstrate assistive technology. Screen readers such as NVDA and JAWS and screen magnification software such as Magic. When you have a better understanding of the needs of your users with disabilities, you can take that knowledge into your interactions with vendors. So uh, back in January, after we had completed this inventory, I was actually looking forward to, for once, uh, our next license negotiation for a new e-resource. So I could put all of this vendor outreach theory into practice and report back about how wildly successful it all was. As it turns out, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. So my first opportunity came in February of this year as the library was licensing a new political science resource that was just being released to the academic market. The boilerplate contract didn't have any accessibility language, so I requested the insertion of the suggested language from our procurement department, department, and they accepted. Great, exactly one day later though, they came back and said their legal counsel was uncomfortable with the language because the resource was still being developed and not yet 100% ADA compliant. I asked if they had suggested alternative language, which they didn't. I then came back with slightly modified language taken from the lib license model stating that they will make reasonable efforts to comply with ADA, and they did agree to this language. Obviously, I would have preferred to not use the weakened language, but reasoned that some accessibility clause was better than none. And after only a minimum of prodding emails, they also furnished us with a fairly well-documented VPAT. I, I did note that it was dated mid-February around the time we were negotiating the accessibility language in the license, so I would like to think that my dogged pestering contributed to them completing it. The vendor rep also told me that another university they were licensing with had worked in similar accessibility language, so that's also a reassurance that there are other voices in the library community advocating for this. So that was something of a qualified victory. Another license we were negotiating got held up over a month while council reviewed the accessibility question. Uh, the, the vendor ultimately did not include our suggested language, but they did confirm uh, that while some features of their site complied with WCAG criteria, other interactive areas of the site did not support screen reader software. They also told me they would have a VPAT available sometime this summer, and I'm still waiting on that one. Uh, following the completion of the accessibility inventory, we've successfully gotten at least some form of accessibility compliance verbiage into six out of seven new licenses. If there's been any early takeaways so far, it's that our vendors have generally been open to discussing accessibility, though they will often insist on adding qualifying phrases such as reasonable efforts or where possible to our accessibility clause. I will say it hasn't been without frustration. For a new streaming video uh, database that we license, the vendor straight up told me, we've already invested $17 million into this database. Capturing the videos would cost us an additional $100,000. It was a little shocking to hear this coming from a vendor and also frustrating that they would view captioning as an added feature instead of something inherently built into their product. I would counter that you wouldn't build a new office building without including wheelchair ramps at the entrance but sometimes arguments like this only get you so far with vendors. That said, uh, this vendor did finally accept a modified accessibility clause, and overall, we've been able to engage with vendors on why accessibility matters. With this early evidence and admittedly small sample size, I would surmise that based on the evidence of their uh, advice of their legal counsel, Vendors are wary of committing to a full assurance of accessibility compliance. I can't say this is at all surprising, but the result is that our contract language ends up being weaker than we would like it to be. 
I think one potentially beneficial tactic would be to negotiate for your rights to adapt or modify your license materials so they will meet the needs of your users with disabilities. Another suggestion I've seen in the literature is working in a time frame where the vendor specifies when they expect to reach compliance and to what standard level. That's not something we've done at this point, though I'd definitely love to hear from other librarians who have done it. So one additional frustration that's been born out of the, the licensing process is the lack of teeth to our accessibility efforts. At the end of the day, we, do, we don't have the weight of a university mandate or state legislation to refuse the purchase of non-compliant resources. Uh, again, we're a private university. Uh, it's possible this may change over time. Uh, so yeah, we're a private institution. In some states, public, university have, public universities have instituted robust measures for vendors to document their accessibility compliance. So on to the next steps. Uh, in terms of next steps at AU, the ERM unit will continue to incorporate accessibility goals in the e-resources lifecycle. As we've been doing in the initial licensing workflow, requests are made to vendors to provide VPATs and accessibility statements. If needed during the trial period, we can consult with accessibility services staff for usability testing and guidance. Before signing new licenses, we request the addition of accessibility clauses if they are not already included in the contract language. At this time, there are no plans to renegotiate our existing licenses for the inclusion of an accessibility language addendum. Instead of that, we're returning to our accessibility inventory and focusing on these resources and vendors that failed to meet any of our accessibility measures. As we found during the inventory, these tended by and large to be the more specialty or niche vendors. So there's certainly a high potential for vendor education here. We'll see how successful this strategy is. Uh, as you recall, at least one of these vendors wanted us to fill out their VPAT for them. But there's always value in just opening up the dialogue. For our inventory, that's also no small amount of vendors, so it'll be useful to formulate an outreach strategy. One possible route could be to bring in our usage statistics for the resources being looked at giving prioritization based on the volume of usage. In summary, we found that the accessibility inventory provided a useful snapshot of our licensed EA resources and current vendors. The metrics we evaluated, such as accessibility statements and VPATs, represent how, at a bare minimum, vendors can demonstrate their commitment to accessibility. It's positive to see that accessibility is increasingly on the radar for vendors, particularly the larger vendors who license a bulk of the bulk of e-resources to libraries. There's certainly still work to be done there, more in the area of usability testing, to ensure that everyone is getting the same user experience. As librarians, there's a lot of work that we can do, both locally and as a community. We can establish our own commitment to acquiring accessible resources through our collection development policies and work with disability services staff at our institutions to test the usability of our existing resources. In our vendor communications, we can ask that they share in this commitment and work towards drafting contracts that spell out their compliance with accessibility guidelines. Moreover, we can communicate as a profession working towards a unified goal. Crowdsource projects like the VPAT repository and ebook accessibility audit benefit us all and allow us to share in this work. Accessibility is an ongoing conversation. If we librarians can add more voices to the chorus, we'll be better equipped to advocate for all of our users. And so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, I've left about 10 minutes for a Q&A. Uh, I saw a couple of other questions pop up, uh, and yeah, I'll be ready to take questions at this time. All right. Um, I have one question here, Michael, for you. Uh, the question was asking, um, have you asked about audio description for waiting? Um, okay, yeah, I see that question. Uh, so I think that was... Um, 
and uh, if uh, the questioner wants to, to specify, but I, I think that was when I was discussing the uh, streaming video uh, collection that we were that we were licensing uh, that had told us that the captioning would be an extra $100,000. Uh, so um, in that case, uh, those 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 videos uh, on that platform did include transcripts, uh, but it didn't include the actual uh, captioning. And uh, I think it, that in that case did include an audio description. But uh, in terms of uh, on a more broader level, um, I don't think we've uh, like at least in terms of our licensing language, uh, we um, we haven't got into kind of that level of specificity for uh, the expectations for uh, for the vendor in terms of compliance. We, uh, as I showed you with the, the verbiage that, that we're using, that typically just speaks to uh, the broader uh, Section 508 and WCAG guidelines and that the vendor adhere to them. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered that question. All right. Um, Michael, if you go to the Q&A, I think there's a couple other questions. I'm having trouble with my computer right now to load this question. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, I'll scroll up there. Um, okay, um, Okay. So, so I can read this one aloud. Uh, Thank you. Did you, yeah, no problem. Uh, did you do any cross-checking of representations by vendors slash resources against the actual accessibility of content, uh, ergo by using screen readers or accessibility testing software? Um, so that's uh, that's a great question, and uh, I think as I've as I've kind of like touched upon, really important uh, usability testing is. Um, Definitely an important piece of this because, you know, as we've seen, uh, the representations made by the vendors in terms of accessibility are not necessarily borne out by the usability testing. So that's definitely important. And uh, the uh, that's kind of the long-winded way of saying like the answer to that is like on our end, no, uh, we did not do any uh, usability testing. Uh, the inventory was solely to gather those measures. Um, in terms of usability testing of our existing resources, uh, again, because of that undertaking and the, the bandwidth needed there and experience, uh, we're not looking to do those. However, uh, as I had said, we have worked with uh, accessibility services uh, at the university and they are willing to, to work with us in terms of like uh, in terms of resources that we're trialing or new resources in terms of doing usability testing. So um, so we haven't taken them up on that yet, but that's uh, certainly a resource for us that we can use in terms of usability testing. Um, and also, again, just kind of add that that's, you know, why I think these community-based projects like the ebook accessibility audit uh, that I had pointed out in one of the earlier slides are so useful because this is, such a large undertaking that, you know, as a community, I think we can really take it on. And usability testing is definitely um, one of the most important aspects of accessibility. Uh, so I think there was, um, okay, not a, a question, but uh, maybe in response to that last one or something I said, uh, someone posted, uh, the BTAA eResource Task Force has been doing accessibility audits and is putting together boilerplate license language, uh, and they, they gave a URL for that. Okay. Um, I think we're caught up with the old questions. Uh, can you, Jan, can you see the new questions? Okay, there is one question asking about will you be sharing your collected accessibility statement? Oh, okay, I see that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that is a uh, that's a good question. At this at this time, uh, we we have no no plans to do that, but. Um, that, um, yeah, that is definitely a good idea for the future and um, 
possibly along the lines of, you know, well, that, that does exist with the VPAT repository, but uh, thus far we haven't uh, contributed statements that are not already in the VPAT repository. So, yeah, again, like that's an example of a, a great community uh, effort towards, uh, towards hosting that and certainly something that in the future uh, we, we, can, we can take a look into contributing further to that. So then there's a question about can you share that URL? Um, I'm not sure which URL. Oh, yeah. Um, I think, okay. Um, let me try copying and pasting that and just, uh, I'll just copy and paste the whole thing. Um, and then just uh, posting that comment in the chat. Um, okay, so so that went out to all participants, and hopefully everyone sees that link now. Okay, um, I have another question here. It's a could you clarify what community resources exist to pull results of usability testing? Oh, um, yeah, so uh, I can probably pull up the slide that's got a screenshot. Uh, so the one that I was specifically referring to was the ebook accessibility audit. Uh, okay, according to my notes, that's slide number eight. Uh, there we go. Um, and that is, uh, there's a URL for that. Uh, so yeah, again, this, uh, this was done in the UK and they looked at, uh, I think they covered all of the major ebook uh, providers and they uh, evaluated their uh, ebook platforms and did usability testing on it. Um, actually, multiple participants did the testing for each of the uh, ebook platforms. So, um, so uh yeah those um so yeah this uh the, the the reports that you can download there are a compilation of of the findings in terms of their usability testing okay okay um here's another question is uh we recently had an issue where an ILL article was not scanned improperly for a screen reader. Are you aware of any awareness efforts in the ILL area? Um, okay. Um, Okay, sorry, could you repeat, <laughs> Yan, could you repeat the question? Okay, yeah, this is about the RL article that was scanned, um, was not scanning properly for a screen reader, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was asking if you are aware of any efforts in the RLL area. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that I, I cannot say that I'm I'm aware of uh, anything being done on the ILL side for that um, in terms of mm -hmm. yeah like the compatibility with assistive technology. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I again I, I would direct uh, if that becomes an issue, I would direct people to um, their university's uh, disability support office uh, and. They would be the ones who uh, have the expertise on the assistive software and technology, um, and could hopefully work around that. So, yeah, sorry on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have about one minute. I know I think there is maybe a couple other questions we have not addressed yet. Um, Michael, is that okay that uh, we'll send the question to you and see if you have an answer, and then we can share the answers to everybody. Uh, yeah, sure. That that works. Okay. Um, and my contact information is out there, so certainly happy to answer any of those questions as best as I can. Yeah, or you can just email Michael directly to get your question answers. That's another way to do it. 
All right. Um, I want to say, uh, you know, thank you everyone and for joining us today. And this is very, very helpful. Um, so we hope to see you at our next uh, continued education event. Actually, we have a November webinar um, uh, scheduled. It's on, uh, let me check, what is this about? Okay, it's on checking down the problem, the development of a web skill discovery troubleshooting workflow. So if you have not uh, registered yet, um, go to this website and uh, check it out. So we are looking forward to see you at our next webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.